This YouTube series is made possible in part by the generous contribution of our Smart Insiders Plus members. If you're not a member, join in now. Just go to smartrecovery.org forward slash insiders. Welcome to the program. Today we're speaking with Dr. Tom Horvath. He is a PhD from the California School of Professional Psychology at San Diego and is a board certified clinical psychologist of the American Board of Professional Psychology. Dr. Horvath is a past president and fellow of the San Diego Psychological Association, and he received their Distinguished Contribution to Psychology Award. He has also been elected a fellow of the American Psychological Association and the Association for Behavioral and Cognitive Therapies. Germaine, to this interview is Dr. Horvath founded Practical Recovery and is one of the founders of Smart Recovery, where he was president for 20 years. Tom Horvath, welcome to the program. Thanks, Luke. Glad to be here. Before we get into the major subject for today's interview, tell me a little bit more about your history with uh, founding SMART. That's a great place to start. There were about 20 of us that I consider co-founders who in February 1991 flew to Dallas and agreed to start this organization. And many continued on to the board of what became SMART Recovery in 1994. And two of us, Joe Gerstein and I, have continuously served on that board since then. Um, I was also president for 20 years. Uh, I have been the clinical psychologist closest to and most connected with the theoretical issues that an organization like SMART has to address, answering very simple questions that we need to keep revisiting. What do we do exactly? And how exactly do we do it? And why do we do it that way? Uh, these are questions that we continually need to think about. I've also been the primary support for SMART in San Diego, we're tucked down in the lower southwest corner of the United States, and we have a thriving uh, local community here, about 45 meetings locally. We've had our own community center for about a decade now, social events. Uh, we even do bird watching together. We, okay. We've got a, a great community. Uh, and lastly, uh, since the pandemic began, I've run meetings for many years, but since the pandemic began, I run four to five meetings a week now. So I'm very active in our local community in that way. Yeah, so that's absolutely. smart. Mm -hmm. And then I actually began specializing in addiction as a psychologist in 1985. And I'd been using three of the four points in my work uh, until that time. So they you're, you're just, speaking of the SMARTS uh, four point program. Yes. Those three points just moved into the SMART four point program and we added one more. Um, to round that out. Uh, at Practical Recovery, I think we offer state-of-the-art self-empowering addiction treatment, and um, all of the psychologists on staff also lead SMART meetings uh, as part of our San Diego community. Right. So they've, they've worked hand in hand. Right. And um, I've heard it mentioned that uh, San Diego is actually like an island because you're surrounded by what, the ocean and Mexico and what else is around you? Well, we've got Camp Pendleton, the Marine Corps base to the north, and then foothills in the desert to the east. And you can get in and, in and out on roads. It's not like a community in Alaska you can only fly into, but, <laughs> okay. but yeah, we're, a... we're kind of discreet all by ourselves. Mm -hmm. Well, it sounds like you have quite an impact in San Diego with some of the work you're doing and some of your colleagues. So that's, uh, that's wonderful. Um, so the subject today is really we're going to focus on uh, Dr. Nora Volkoff. She is the, uh, uh, let's see, the president of, of NIDA or the director. Director, director of NIDA. And she wrote a column that was quite interesting and it appeared in uh, Health Affairs Forefront, I think is the name of the publication. And it has kind of a long title, but I want to make sure I get it right. She wrote that making addiction treatment more realistic and pragmatic, the perfect should not be the enemy of the good. I mean, that's quite a, that's quite a title and a lot of, lot of things to unpack in there. Um, what was your first kind of reaction when you read it or heard about it? Well, my first reaction, I've followed Dr. Volkoff's work. She's a very important person. She's a very prominent scientist and her position as the person in charge of the single largest funder of addiction research in the world, to my knowledge, makes her a very powerful person. I've been following what she says for a long time. And my first reaction was she's singing a new song. And I was just delighted to hear it because in many ways, she's saying things that many of us, many of us have said for decades, but when she says it, it's, uh, 
more important than when some yeah. others of us. Well, I'm going gonna, gonna to date myself. And I think there used to be a advertisement for a, a brokerage house that said, when EF Hutton talks, people listen. That's that's appropriate. <laughs> okay, so you would say when Nora Volkoff talks, people listen. I hope so. Okay, good. I hope so. Um, so you had that response, and and then you wrote a uh, blog post on uh, the Practical Recovery website, um, and you mentioned a lot of things about that. What what was the first thing that kind of you wanted to mention about this this article? Well, uh, to summarize it, she says. We've got an addiction overdose crisis. It's the worst it's ever been, and it's still getting worse. We need a coordinated response to this. And I think she's saying we, we need some fresh approaches because what we're doing isn't working. That's fair enough. Mm -hmm. And she goes on to say that uh, because the medications that do work, particularly with opiate uh, use disorders, are not being used very widely. Roughly one person is in eight is getting treatment or medication. It's a mm -hmm. very small percentage. That is, that is too small. And it appears to be that this focus on abstinence only is the primary impediment to getting more treatment out there, getting more people into treatment, more medication use. So she is arguing from her very high position that we need to consider non-abstinent goals. And that flies in the face of the traditional wisdom, which has been that if you're not engaging in abstinence, you're wasting your time. Whatever short-lived benefit you'll get mm -hmm. will not be worthwhile. And Dr. Volkoff is saying, no, that's not true. We can, we can have partial benefit. We can have other goals. Yeah. Well, do you consider that, in, in your view, a, a natural evolution of thinking for the past decades, or is it like a, a, a big leap all at one time? Well, it's a big leap for the National Institute on Drug Abuse and Dr. Volkoff, although I don't know what she's been thinking privately all these years. I know that in years past, she has debated various people, either in print or in person, about addiction as a disease and what that implies for treatment. And this is a new song. So in that sense, it's big, but um, the idea is that she's citing, although there's more evidence now, and I, what I'd like to think is that she just looked at this evidence and decided this is a compelling picture. I can't ignore this anymore, but the ideas have been there for decades. Okay. Well, and, and, and you also called it, I didn't want to uh, overlook this, you, you called it a courageous statement. Um, what, what prompted that particular kind of word? It's taking courage or taking, you know, why, did, why that word, Tom? Well, I do admire what she's done. And I do believe it's courageous because although I haven't heard a lot yet, I think there's going to be some pretty serious blowback on these ideas. Yeah, I thought of an analogy, a couple of analogies to help clarify this. Uh, in the traditional way of thinking, if you're not pursuing abstinence, it's like building a sandcastle at the water's edge on the beach at low tide. You're a fool not to realize that when the tide comes in, your sandcastle is going to be gone. Mm. And any effort that you make to do something harm reduction oriented or moderation oriented will just get wiped out over time. And why waste your effort? Why promote this for people? You're just killing them. That's, that's a, a version of the traditional thinking. But very, new... extre very extreme. I mean, very extreme because there, there would never be a time when high tide wouldn't ruin that sandcastle. Well, that's the belief. It's just wasted effort. I think a different analogy is that um, you're presiding over a garden. And even if your garden is entirely filled with weeds, it doesn't mean that you have to eliminate every weed and keep close watch over it every moment. You could, in fact, clean out a section, maybe a couple sections. You don't have to do the whole thing. And that that progress in your garden could be stable. It could be meaningful. And 
you might live the rest of your life with a half weeded, half unweeded garden. Maybe you'll eventually weed it all, but we should celebrate um, that progress. I think that's the best word uh, to use. And she says in the article very clearly, let's not, the per let's not have the perfect be the enemy of the good. And we need as much good as we can get right now. Mm -hmm. She's very clear about that. I, I hear a lot of tolerance in those kinds of statements, tolerance for views that aren't the orthodoxy, you know, tolerance for developing different views about how to deal with this crisis. I mean, you, you well know the the overdose deaths uh, topped 100,000. I mean, this is a, this is a, a tragedy. It's, it's the only word for it. It is a shocking, shocking number. Mm -hmm. And every one of those deaths, has people attached to it and stories attached to it right. so that and there's a lot of suffering that goes along with that. Right. So is that is that the uh, kind of the crux of it or one of the pillars that there's a just a, a more tolerance for views and developing different ways of thinking? Well, yes, because it appears that in part this overdose uh, overdose crisis has arisen because of this abstinence only focus, you could say fixation, we don't have a welcoming treatment system. What you pretty much know in the United States is that if you go to treatment, they're gonna insist that you abstain. They might even well, kick you out. Dr. Volkoff mentioned in their article that they kick, kick you out of a treatment center. Right, for confirming your diagnosis, no. <laughs> which is kind of ironic. Uh, and because of that, so few people go to treatment. And then if they do go, they don't get the medications that could in fact be very helpful. Now the medications don't work for everybody, but they, they would help quite a few people. Nothing works for everybody, mm -hmm. but we could dramatically increase how many people are on medications and we would all benefit. Yeah. Well, that, that kind of brings to mind for me, this, this idea that there are goals associated with non-abstinence. Um, you know, there, there are progress, as you said, I mean, this, I love your analogy about the garden. I mean, a garden is still beautiful. A garden still yields things, even mm -hmm. if there's some weeds in there. What are, mm -hmm. what, what are you kind of thinking about when you, when you would consider goals of non-abstinence? Well, <clears throat> when we're talking about opiate users, a goal could be that I will only use clean needles, which I will get from the syringe exchange if I have one nearby. I will always test my drugs with a fentanyl test strip. I will go to a, a safe injection site if one is available. Um, those are some very basic things. Uh, with other substances, it, it's specific to the substance. You know, you don't have a drinking limit if you're an opiate user, it's irrelevant, but if you're a drinker, you do. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. In each substance, those kinds of guidelines can make a meaningful difference. And she cites in the article examples of um, goals that are less than abstinence, but have even been used in research that indicate improvement. Mm -hmm. She also mentions in that article uh, this idea of a, I'm going to read here, healthcare and society must move beyond this dichotomous moralistic view of drug use and abstinence. Mm -hmm. You know, that's judgmental. That's judgmental. And, and who gets to judge that kind of thing? For any of us, when we figured out a way to do something, we tend to think of it as the right way. And uh, we want other people to do it that way. We feel better that we have been supported. But what we need to recognize is that there are as many solutions to these problems as there are individuals. We talk about multiple pathways of recovery, but it's probably individual pathways of recovery. And she's recognizing that that's the case and that we shouldn't jump in and say, because you're not doing it my way, uh, you're not right. And of course, the 12-step way has been the dominant way in the United States, and it works for all those people for whom it works, but it's carrying it a step too far to say that's how everybody has to do it. Right. That, that, that's the only way. And that's, uh, that, that's, a can be a deterrent. You know, if mm -hmm. I, if I, if I think that there's only one way and I don't relate to it, it doesn't resonate with me. I don't get value out of it. 
then what am I to do but continue the the other lifestyle? I mean, that could be, but the other dichotomy she talks about is this uh, sense of when a person uses again, and and we could get into the terms: is it relapse? Is it a slip? Is it a whatever you want to call it? That then you know everything's back to zero. Um, is that is that fair, Tom? It's it's not very accurate because. Um, I think a better analogy is if you picture um, a rocket leaving Earth and uh, heading into outer space, and if the first uh, booster drops off, it slows down for a while before the second one kicks in. And sometimes there's multiple bursts of energy that have to get you to where you're going. You don't fall back to Earth just because you haven't gotten your second booster going yet. Um, Most recovery trajectories, and that's the term we, we typically use, are a little bumpy. And uh, if we keep the long-term goal in mind, most people actually succeed. Most people finally resolve their addictive problems. It just takes longer than all of us would want. But if we could get them into some active support earlier, uh, we might speed up some of these trajectories, and which is why uh, Dr. Volkoff wants us to be more welcoming and more accepting. In addition to, to your uh, analogy of the rocket, there's also, um, I heard this from actually Bill Greer, the, the president of the smart board right now, where he talks about you're driving a car from Washington to Boston and you get a flat tire in New York. You don't change the tire and go back to Washington. You change the tire and move on to Boston. I mean, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. And I, I think it would make a lot of sense to people who, who would feel very bad about a return to drug use, however, however intermittently or briefly. Um, is that the kind of thing you're talking about? I mean, we have to look differently at what happens in this trajectory, as you said. In my experience in leading meetings, some of the best meetings are the ones where somebody comes in and goes, oh, I blew it. I, I binged over the weekend and I feel horrible and I was so ashamed that I didn't even want to tell the group, but I realized I really need to tell you. And the groups are so supportive, you know, thank you for coming. Thank you for telling us. Let's talk about what happened. We're so glad you're here. We're so glad you're back on track. What do you think happened? What was going on? Did you like it? Was it fun? That's a crucial question. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What, What is the answer mostly? Well, I mean, sometimes people will say, well, it w- was kind of fun for the first hour, but the next 47 were miserable. Oh, boy. <laughs> uh, yeah. Or sometimes they say, you know, I, I, it really didn't do it for me at all, but then I just felt compelled to keep going. Every answer is different, but the, the groups can be such a wonderful experience for everybody because everybody like comes out with a little bit more knowledge about what I need to look for so that doesn't happen to me. And the person feels all this relief that they've gotten it off their chest and they're back on track. So at least in SMART and in my practice, I think it's the same way. That's a step. It's not so much a step backwards. It's like a step to the side. And you you pause for a while and then you keep moving again. And sometimes that side step lasts a while, granted. But sometimes it's brief and, and people confirm again why this was a good idea to start with. And you could forget that. So it's a, it, it can be a good reminder. Mm-hmm. And also it could take uh, you longer to change the tire um, on that car or, or mm-hmm. kick in the second booster in, in the rocket. Yeah. Um, the other thing I appreciated about your um, response, if you will, your post there on practical recovery is you noted that it was very good that she, I, I assume you're saying it's good, uh, mm-hmm. mentioning autoimmune diseases and infection diseases but not mentioning addiction as a disease. Can you say more about that? Well, if we go back to that sandcastle analogy, um, if you're convinced that you have a disease, then moderation doesn't make any sense. Um, But if you throw that idea out, we're just not gonna think about disease in this context, then we're not gonna identify anybody for whom moderation or harm reduction is a bad idea. We're going to encourage everybody to at least start moving in the right direction. And rather than trying to sort out who has this disease and who 
hasn't. Now, I don't know if Dr. Volkoff has gone from being a very staunch advocate of addiction as a disease to having changed her mind. I don't want to speak for her, but I think she's saying, even if it is a disease, we should put that concept off on the side and just encourage everybody to make progress. And, and we'll make much more progress collectively if that's our stance than if we're trying to sort people out as to who can make progress and who can't. Let's assume everybody can make progress. Yeah. So putting that aside, putting that aside, not saying it, it, it is not worthy of discussion, but putting mm-hmm. it aside and saying, what should we really focus on? Yeah. And I think she's saying, let's focus on progress. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, a, that's my word. That's not the word she used, but I think uh, we could call it progress, improvements, uh, continuous effort. I think that's good language for smart recovery also for us to consider. Yeah. And she does mention the, speaking of progress, the, uh, the slogan, progress, not perfection, um, which is used largely in, in 12 step, or that's the context that I've actually heard it. Um, is that, that the bottom line we're talking about progress, not perfection? Well, I, I think that might have been in my article, not hers, actually. Um, And I got a little flack about using that because in in AA, it refers to one's spiritual development. But I was making an analogy. If in any part of your life, you can think of progress, not perfection, as a way to think about moving forward, we could think about substance problems the same way. So you're already used to thinking that way. And the truth is, I think, other than addiction, there are very few things in life where people insist on an all or none approach to making progress. Uh, Addiction has been one of the few places where you've got to have it all or you have nothing. Mm -hmm. Most of the things in my life, I've worked my way up to little by little. And I think that's a description of most change that most of us make most of the time. Yeah, that's, that's, I mean, that's about change and, uh, you know, making, um, what am I thinking of incremental uh, yes. progress and, and not feeling like no, any progress is no progress until you achieve 100%. You yeah. know, that that's dangerous too. And I think, you know, in the 12 step tradition, you're right. I think that is connected to spiritual progress, not spiritual perfection, mm-hmm. but I think more colloquially in, in society outside the 12 step rooms, people get that, you know, they mm-hmm. get that you could apply that to any number of things. I'm, I'm making progress on uh, getting my, um, my landscaping done. It's not perfect yet, but yeah. I'm making progress. Um, mm-hmm. And that's where she comes uh, with, with the phrase, the don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Yeah. Is, is good good enough, Tom? I mean, is that what I'm hearing you say, that it, that it really is sub, some substantial progress is, is, can be good enough? And I suggest, and I do this more with my clients because I wouldn't take this active a role in a meeting. I generally want participants talking to one another. But with a client, I would say, look, let's go through your life and take an inventory of all the situations in which you have already decided that good enough is good enough. Um, How organized is your closet? Is your, um, are your financial affairs entirely in order? Um, Your uh, estate plan, could that use some work? Uh, How well do you brush your teeth? I mean, I can go through (laughs) a long list and I, pretty soon I got people going, well, yeah, that's, that's not as good as it could be. That's not as good as it could be. I mean, the, the truth is most of your life is not as good as somebody else does that part because you don't have time to do everything perfectly. There's only so much time in life. Uh, you know, you could call your mother and your relatives more. I mean, the, the list is like endless. You have picked a way through life in which you've got lots of good enough. Mm-hmm. And you're perfectly happy with it. You don't even think about it until some obnoxious person like me starts pointing it out. <laughs> but it's a good example of how we're very comfortable with good enough. There's even the phrase in the psychology literature about mothers. You just need to be a good enough mother. That's the technical term. And most of life is like this. So you could have a good enough recovery also or even close to good enough would be a big improvement over nothing at all. 
Yeah. Cause you know what happens when you put perfection as uh, more than an ideal. Now treating perfection as an ideal is one thing, but treating perfection as a requirement um, is entirely another thing. And, and, you know, then you, you can get the negative self-talk. Oh boy. I didn't, you know, I, I didn't have a perfect uh, uh, outing to the gym. I, I got kind of tired and, and didn't do my five miles on the treadmill. Yeah. But instead of realizing you did 4.5 miles um, mm-hmm. and that benefited you with cardio and, and strength. Um, yeah. So that's perfection is, is a, is a, you know, a, a negative thing in, in many regards. We don't want to eliminate the term perfection. And I want my brain surgeon and my pilot to be perfectionistic, <laughs> uh, but I don't expect them to be perfectionistic about everything. Just a few crucial things. Right. So, um, yeah. And then she goes on to say, when we push for this perfection and then somebody doesn't reach it, which will happen very often, then they have all this shame and guilt, which becomes very counterproductive. And uh, we're just, we're obstructing what we're trying to accomplish. So I think her article makes complete sense. And I, yeah. I truly hope uh, within SMART and within the community at large, that people will uh, appreciate that an insistence upon abstinence is count. Okay. And speaking of that, uh, have you had conversations with colleagues uh, in or out of SMART um, about Dr. Volkoff's uh, article? Well, uh, without naming any names, some people were laughing and like, what took her so long? And, but that's the crowd I hang out with okay. um, professionally uh, and within SMART, at least uh, Within San Diego, it's pretty much how we think. I think there, there are different perspectives on it within different quarters of SMART and among different professionals. I don't hang out with a 12-step disease model-oriented crowd. I'm still eager to find out what, what they think about it. But I do think when Nora Volkoff has been so clear in such a prominent place that um, the burden has now shifted uh, prior to this, I would have said, I feel a little bit uh, on the defensive when I'm pushing progress, not perfection. But now um, I think maybe the other folks are going to be on the defensive. We'll have to wait and see. That's that's an interesting point, because you have who sets the uh, the, the agenda, the, the conversation. I had a professor years ago who talked about, you know, um, how did he put it? The sense of uh, he who defines the conversation controls the conversation. It wasn't quite exactly like that, but it was yeah. basically true power lies in the the definition who defines power, for instance. Mm-hmm. So that's uh, that can be a thing. Well, as we're starting to wrap up, what else uh, would you say about Dr. Volkoff's article or kind of how you responded to it? I mean, it, it's, it's obvious you were very thoughtful in your response to it. I was so thrilled to see it and just I'm thinking about what are the implications for SMART? Can we be even more? uh, We've always been a progress, not perfection oriented. I mean, I I drafted some of the original documents and that was the orientation behind them. But we've also had phrases like abstinence based and abstinence oriented. And will some of that... uh, be up for consideration for changing. Uh, what will professionals say? I mean, my hope is that, let's say I'm just your average person who this Saturday night gets drunk for the first time in his life and goes, oh, geez, you know, maybe I've got more of a problem than I realized. Hey, I've heard about this smart recovery group and I hear they're happy to have anybody show up that I don't have to have serious problems. I don't have to commit to anything. I can just show up, see what I can learn. I think I'll go check out a meeting. And uh, I would love to see people at all ranges of problems just feel free to show up to a meeting. Maybe they only come once, maybe they come a few times, but they feel like we're a welcoming place and we're not insisting on anything. We're just here to exchange ideas and learn from one another. Mm -hmm. And if if we could achieve that position in society and people who get drunk once or twice or for three months running and they decide, okay, it's time to talk to somebody. 
that we would be one of the first places they think of, then I, th then I think we would be doing the kind of good that we really, uh, well, that I really hoped yeah. we would someday be in the position to do. Yeah, that's hugely impactful. Um, and it also speaks to the self-empowering nature of SMART. You know, yes. I'm going to go check this out. I'm going to respond to it. Uh, I'm not going to sit down and, and be told what to do, um, right. which, which isn't what SMART's about. We've been uh, talking with Dr. Tom Horvath. He's been talking about the uh, wonderful article by Dr. Nora Volkoff, the uh, director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse or Addiction. I always get that wrong. It's drug abuse. Maybe they'll drug. change that name someday, but that's what it is at the moment. Now, that's an interesting point. So thanks again, Tom. And uh, until next time on our conversations, stay healthy and stay connected. This YouTube series is made possible in part by the generous contribution of our Smart Insiders Plus members. If you're not a member, join in now. Just go to smartrecovery.org forward slash insiders.